This is Brent of the Brookbush Institute and in this video we're going to go over a joint based manual therapy technique. If you're watching this video, I'm assuming you're watching it for educational purposes and that you're a licensed professional with joint based techniques within your scope. That means osteopaths, chiropractors, physical therapists, you're probably all in the clear, physical therapy assistants, athletic trainers, massage therapists, you need to check with your governing body in your state or region to see whether this is within your scope of practice. Personal trainers, this is definitely not within your scope of practice. Of course, all professions could use this video for purely educational purposes to help with learning biomechanics, anatomy, and of course, palpation. In this video, we're gonna do posterior to anterior tibia on femur, or rather, let's do anterior to posterior femur on tibia mobilization since they're the same relative arthrokinematic motion, but the latter allows us to get in good pot body position, making it easy for us to perform the technique. I'm gonna have my friend Melissa come out. She's gonna help me demonstrate this technique. Now, if I'm doing this technique on Melissa, I've already done some sort of passery excessive motion exam on her knee, and I've assessed her as having arthrokinematic stiffness, right? We don't wanna be using mobilizations on hypermobile joints. That's not gonna make anybody feel better. The other joint action we need to check for because of the way this technique is set up is if Melissa had beyond normal extension of the knee, that's beyond five degrees of hyperextension, I also wouldn't use this technique because of the way I'm pushing down this way. I could end up making hyperextension, hypermobility worse, which is also not gonna make anybody feel any better. Now, traditionally this technique is used to increase extension of the knee. So somebody who lacks full range of extension. And this is all based on concave on convex rules, that's glide same as roll. However, I think research is kinda of pointing to the fact that those rules are not completely reliable when it comes to the knee. Now what does that mean? It probably means that mobilization in either direction could potentially be effective for either extension or flexion, which I know creates some gray area, but here's what you're gonna do. This is the technique I fall back on most often because I find it most effective most often. But if you wanted to try mobilization in the other direction, the only thing I would ask is that you assess, do your intervention, and reassess. And then if you were gonna try the other technique, do that and reassess again. You wanna to try to determine which technique, which direction of glide is most effective, write that down and continue to use that with your patient or client. Now I'm gonna have Melissa go ahead and put her leg down so that you guys can see what I'm doing to Melissa's knee here, what my hand position is, what I'm palpating and how I set this up. So we wanted to do a posterior to anterior glide on the tibia, or the tibia on the femur. And rather, we turned it around. So we're gonna do anterior to posterior on the femur so that we can push, because pushing is a lot easier than pulling. I don't wanna manhandle and wear my hands out or wear my body out trying to do this mobilization. In order to get myself a little space, anterior to posterior, I had to elevate Melissa's leg just a little bit. So that's where this half foam roll comes in and guys I find half foam rolls to be the best thing for this technique and notice this isn't one of those super hard like premium foam rolls this is kind of a a softish foam roll so it's firm but not so firm that it's mean on Melissa's calf right you could use a pillow like one of these round pillows that's under Melissa's head just realize that if you use one of those round pillows you're gonna to have to push all the way through the pillow's softness before you're gonna be palpating any sort of arthrokinematic motion. Now, like all of our techniques for mobilizations and soft tissue techniques and sometimes even exercise, the more anatomy you know, the better. With the knee, maybe you wanna start by finding the patella. The kneecap's kinda of easy to find. All right, so I can start outlining the borders of her patella I can find her patellar tendon or patellar ligament, depending on what you want to particularly call it. Uh, I'll, I'll find her tibial tuberosity right here. I can find the top of her patella, and then maybe I want to let my hand sink down medial and lateral so that I can feel through her soft tissue and find those femoral condyles, which should feel like roundish bumps kind of on the superior half 
of where her patellar was, right? So the end of the femur. If I go lower than that, I should be able to feel the, the tibia, which is going to feel a little bit more ridgy, right? So your femoral condyles are nice and round. Your tibia kind of comes up and then hits a plateau. Now, if you visualize that, you should be able to come to the end of those round bumps and the end of all those ridges and find a depression that's a line. That's the joint line. This is going to be an important part of this technique. The thing that we really want to try to, to palpate. So see if you can feel through that soft tissue in here nicely. Don't jab your fingers into your, your partner's, client's, or patient's knee. That's not going to feel good. But gently kind of try to find that joint line. If you want, you could have your patient like flex their knee a little bit and then straighten it, flex it, and straighten it, flex it, and straighten it so that you can kind of find where that joint line is. There we go. Got it. All right, once I found her joint line, I'm just going to set my hands down around her patella because the last thing I want to do is this. If you guys know Clark's sign or Clark's test or the patellar compression test, if you've ever done it, it just kind of hurts everybody. It's not a real great test. It's supposed to be a test for knee pain, but you push down on somebody's patella and have them extend, it just freaking hurts, so don't do that. Instead, take your web spaces and just kind of put it around the patella, put your index fingers and your thumbs down over the joint line. Now you're gonna apply pressure using the arm that's over the femur with the palm of your hand. And you really wanna use a lot of the surface of your hand. I've explained this in some of your other in, uh, in some of our other videos. You don't want to use fingertips to do mobilizations if you don't have to, because they're going to feel really pointy. And even your web space, with its very narrow uh, surface area, can feel like a chisel into somebody's knee. It just doesn't feel good, All right? So hands down, right around the patella, just like so. We're going to put index fingers on the joint line, thumbs on the joint line, and I'm getting ready to push down here. Now is where we start thinking about, okay, do I have any contraindications to think about? Well, obviously, if I started pressing in, if I started in like this, and Melissa immediately starts complaining of pain, that would be a bad thing. We might want to back off and find another technique. And of course, if you have somebody who's come in after acute knee injury, you got to start thinking about, did they potentially tear any of the ligaments of the knee? Even like just mild, mild tears can, can cause a pretty significant amount of pain. And maybe you have to go back and do your special tests. Of course, you could press down and impinge on some nerves or impinge on some trigger points. Generally, those are easy to get around by just moving your hands a tiny bit. Remember, trigger points aren't generally very large things and nerves are definitely not very large things, right? They're very narrow. We're talking like millimeters. So usually you can just kind of reposition your hands if somebody's like, ah, and I'm like, well, what, what happened? You're like, the, the, uh, right above my knee, it hurt. Okay, let me, let me move my hand around a little bit. Notice that the table is low enough so that I can get my chest over this technique. Because once again, I don't want to muscle this technique. Melissa has super strong legs and the knee is a nice big joint. So I want to be able to use my upper body mass to create the force. And now I'm just going to go back to whatever protocol it is that I use. Now, I've mentioned in other videos, I happen to be in a certified orthopedic manual therapist through, through Maitland. Um, so I use the 50% uh, grade three and four, right? So grade threes would be larger amplitude at 50%. Grade four would be smaller amplitude at 50%. Now that's 50% between first resistance barrier and end of arthrokinematic range. And you're gonna keep oscillating at one to two oscillations per second until you feel a decrease in joint stiffness. Now, if you use another protocol, that's fine. I think there's a lot of protocols out there. The thing they all have in common is finding first resistance barrier. So that's first resistance barrier for Melissa. And I'm palpating the joint line right now. So I should be able to really easily find where the end of arthrokinematic range is. That is, no matter how much harder I push right now, I'm not getting any more motion in glide. That's femur on tibia glide. No matter how much harder I push, I'm not getting any more motion. So I know 
where the beginning is, I know where the end is. Most protocols have you mobilized somewhere in between. Whatever protocol you use, just make sure you go through with it, right? Make sure you do it from beginning to end, that you don't half-ass it per se, right? That you actually do the protocol, give the technique a fair chance, so that when you go to reassess, you know whether it was an effective technique and it wasn't just bad form on your part that didn't get you the result that you were looking for. How does that feel? A little weird. A little weird? It does feel a little weird to be pushed, pushed into this direction, right? Like this is, this is end range knee extension. Melissa does have a little bit of stiffness here though, so we're going to see how it makes her feel upon reassessment. I'm thinking she'll feel a little bit better. All right, guys, so I want to set that up for you one more time before we go to the close-up recap. Notice that the table is low enough that when I palpate her knee, I have to lean over just a little bit. That is purposeful so that I can use my upper body mass to create the force and I'm not manhandling and using my upper body strength or the strength of my hands to get this mobilization done. That's not going to work. I then am going to find her patella and I'm going to put my hands down around her patella. No Clark's sign or Clark's test. Right, that's, a bad, that's a bad idea. It hurts so bad. All right. Once I have my hands down around her patella, I think it's good practice to find the joint line. It's going to make it so much easier to find your first resistance barrier and end arthrokinematic range. I'm not sure why it's not more common to teach palpation of the joint line for this technique when your hands are right here. You're then going to apply force through the arm on the femur, right? This hand you can use to kind of make sure that the tibia doesn't rotate if you'd like or to stabilize the tibia or, you know, you could even adjust as you're going the foam roll in case like I, I press down and I press the foam roll right into a, a gastroc or a soleus trigger point, obviously I would move that. This hand essentially though is just going to be there to stabilize while this one applies the force. I'm going to find my first resistance barrier, find the end of arthrokinematic range, back off to 50% and if I was doing a grade 4 it would be a very small amplitude oscillation one to two oscillations per second and notice I'm just rocking my upper body. You guys don't see me doing this with my arms, right? No pumping, I'm not pumping her knee. I'm just rocking with my arms, putting weight this way, right? So it's, it's all coming down through this arm with a nice large surface area created by the entirety of my palm, not my web space. Stay tuned for the close-up recap. So for a close-up recap, guys, once again, it always helps to know your anatomy. So we have Melissa's patella here and then if I just kind of sink my hands down I can start feeling, well there's the fibular head right there. If I follow the fibular head, this nice rounded bony landmark here, I actually feel like a little guitar string right here. That's actually her LCL which leads right into her joint line, which is exactly where I want my thumbs to be. Now notice how I've positioned my hands here, guys. I got both my thumbs over the joint line so that I can feel glide, but my hands themselves are around her patella. Again, we don't want to mimic Clark's sign and give her patellar pain for no reason. Now as soon as I kind of get myself in good position, I got her leg nice and stable with my left hand here. With my right hand, I'm just going to go ahead and apply a little bit of force until I start to feel some glide. And then I'm going to keep applying force until I feel the end of arthrokinematic range of motion. I then can back off 50% and I can start doing my oscillations. Remember guys, to keep your body weight over your hands, you're using the weight of your upper body mass, your torso to create these oscillations. You're not muscling it with your hands or even trying to muscle it with your arms. It should be a nice sway that's applying all this force. 
And of course, once I finished my mobilizations, I could then go ahead and reassess. So there you have it. Assess, address, reassess. Make sure that every time you choose a joint-based manual therapy technique, it is based on an assessment and that you return to that assessment after you finish the intervention to see if it was effective for the individual, the patient or client that you have in front of you. Ensure that you continue to learn your anatomy because your anatomy is going to help you with your hand placement, with understanding what a joint can do, with understanding what you may gain from this particular technique. And of course, practice. You have to practice these techniques, hopefully not for the first time on a patient or client who just walked in the door. If you can, find a more senior instructor or a mentor to give you some really good hands-on instruction. Use your peers for some good feedback. And of course, always look for live education to help with your manual therapy techniques. I know these videos make education very convenient, but there is no substitute for learning manual therapy in a live setting. I look forward to talking to you guys again soon.